This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with Julius Krein, the founding editor of American Affairs, the new journal American Affairs, and also a significant new essay that Julius has contributed in the first issue, James Burnham's Managerial Elite. Julius Krein, welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. So talk about this new journal, American Affairs. I thought we might uh, discuss a little bit of the editorial statement justifying the journal, but you know, tell us why now, why do we need a, a new journal to discuss American politics, economics, culture, etc.? Sure. Well, uh, American Affairs is a quarterly journal of public policy and political thought uh, featuring mainly long-form essays on, uh, on, as you mentioned, economic policy, foreign policy, uh, as well as deeper theoretical themes and, and perhaps some cultural and social criticism as well. Um, and the question, why now, um, you know, I think based on, the, based on the last few months sort of answers uh, itself, um, the, the campaign and victory of Donald Trump shocked everyone, and I would admit including me, and I think Trump has sort of admitted that he didn't really expect it either. And I believe it's clearly a signal of a deeper shift and, and changes um, underlying our politics, uh, a popular dissatisfaction, um, not with one party or another, but really with the broader bipartisan consensus, which is often called the neoliberal uh, or elite consensus. And I think a lot of the things that we've taken for granted since the end of the Cold War uh, on both domestic policy and foreign policy need to be rethought. Specifically, I think the attitudes toward globalization, uh, toward the expansion of, of things like the administrative state, as it's often called, um, need, uh, ha- have not succeeded in the way that their proponents thought they would and need to be rethought outside the broader um, partisan frameworks. So tell us about yourself a bit. I mean, what what sort of crystallized in your mind and your own intellectual journey uh, to put you at a point where you wanted to found a journal, and we can get into this more so, where I think you've really, uh, you're attempting to set yourself apart from uh, the conservative movement. Uh, You're obviously not progressives, but you're seeing things in a new light. You're seeing policies and developments uh, from a new perspective. But uh, how did you arrive there and then and, and arrive at this journal, which I should mention you guys just had. Your, your first issue was released, and you had a huge launch at the Harvard Club of New York City. So a lot of energy behind what you guys are doing. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, just to start uh, with a little bit of background, so... Um, I have been interested in in politics and political philosophy for a long time. I studied with Harvey Mansfield at Harvard um, and have sort of been on the periphery of conservative politics and thought uh, really since college. However, my professional career has mostly been in the investment and finance world. And so while I have been at various times a donor uh, to to various conservative institutions, um, I have not, for the most part, been writing uh, or or anything like that. However, in 2015, 2016, as Donald Trump really um, mounted an insurrection uh, within the Republican Party uh, and and became the front-runner and remained the front-runner, and a lot of the conservative response to that was, well, Trump is bad because he's not a conservative. And a group of friends and I felt that this response was pretty weak. Um, and actually, it may have been a good thing that he wasn't a conservative in the Romney-Ryan sense. Uh, we felt that a lot of that platform no longer was relevant to the most pressing problems and no longer offered much in the way of solutions. So a number of friends and I, this is back in the, uh, well, it's about a year ago, February 2016, started a simple online blog called the Journal of American Greatness in which we put up some essays that we had submitted to more conventional conservative publications that they did not want to publish. 
Um, and this blog, for whatever reason, really took off beyond any of our wildest imaginations and really showed that there was an interest in some of these thoughts and ideas. And um, it, it crystallized in our mind the, the need to maybe do something more. And that blog, of course, was anonymous. Um, but we, we wanted to join the debate in, in a more forthright way and, and uh, stand for uh, our, our own opinions. And that, that success of that blog and the desire to do something more is what led to the creation of this journal, American Affairs. Uh, and it's taken a few months to come together, um, but here it is. Yeah, no, I remember, date, uh, I remember debating one of the authors of Journal of American Greatness. Uh, that was me, actually. It was, it was, it was, was that you? Uh, around this time last year, yeah. You know, it was interesting. Uh, I remember being told I had a small government dog, but I remember thinking, well, wait a minute, I'm a conservative. Of course I do. Uh, I, I suppose if I, if I would have written a reply to you, it would have began with maybe I have a limited government constitutional dogma. But we have your opening statement here, or so say your editor's opening statement. You say... Uh, the conventional party platforms no longer address or even comprehend the most pressing challenges facing American institutions. Uh, economic mobility is down and inequality is up, while growth, productivity, and wages are nearly stagnant. Trust in government is at historic lows. Crime and drug abuse are increasing, uh, while families and communities are disintegrating. The foreign policies of the last two decades have resulted too often in failure and strategic incoherence. The statement goes on to say, um, but our elites ignore these problems, and they bemoan the rise of populism from the left and the right. They say endangers the very foundations of our political system, our mores, even of democracy itself. And, and your response, though, is, what if the real problem with our republic, and you quote Walter Russell Mead here, is, quote, that what should be our leadership elite is soul-sick, vain, restless, easily miffed, intellectually confused, and jealous. Julius, what does that mean to have a leadership elite that is soul-sick? Expound on that. Well, here I will, I think, be probably pretty uh, conventionally conservative for the most part in that I think our leadership elite um, has totally lost touch with the, the found, both the founding principles of of the United States and also with any application to what those mean. Uh, and, they, and specifically, they have lost any contact with the really existing political community uh, in this country. Um, I would say that's the critique of the, the conservatives being out of touch, is that um, a lot of them are happy to quote uh, the founders or Lincoln, um, but they have sort of separated abstract ideas from the real interests uh, of American citizens living here now, um, and that's one area we, we hope to sort of reconnect um, those ideas to to the actual circumstances we inhabit. So question here, I mean, for you, it's interesting, too, just reading your, your statement. Uh, you, you, you say, or your editors say, we have, we have heard endless calls for new New Deals and another Reagan revolution. That sounds familiar. Yet today, Americans spend more on education and our students perform worse. We spend more on health care and receive less. We spend more per unit of infrastructure and build less. We spend more on defense and get the F-35 debacle. We have lower taxes but slower economic growth. As I read that statement, and I don't want to abstract it or lift it from the overall uh, mission statement that you write, but it sounds to me like uh, conservatism would, would agree with you. Conventional conservatives would largely agree with you, even while there is, I think, an elite think, within I, the Republican yeah, I, Party that would... That I think does that I think does converge, as you've noted, uh, uh, on foreign policy, on trade, on immigration, on social liberal cultural issues. But I, it does seem to me that what's at the core of conservatism would largely agree with that statement. Well, I, I think it would, it'd be nice to believe that's true, um, but I think the last two sentences in particular highlight some differences, namely that conservatives are often um, too quick to simply blame all our problems on too high taxes um, or, or too much regulation or whatever. I think there's still a tendency out there to believe that sort of 
you know, the need to drown government in a bathtub is, is the main uh, solution and too large government is the main problem. I don't think that's true in every circumstance, and I think there are significant deviations uh, from the conservative traditional doctrine on things like free trade, et cetera, um, that conservatism has completely missed. Now, how would you see uh, within that mix, I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of my libertarian colleagues here at Liberty Fund, they would sort of look at, they would sort of look at that and say, yeah, uh, I, I kind of agree with you, but the, but the problem is the intertwining of government with uh, a lot of these um, ideas or the intertwining of government with the market and you know leading to these sort of oppressive power constraints whereby the markets can't grow, uh, we can't get wage growth, we can't get productivity growth. And that's precisely because they would they would argue a lot of conservatives don't recognize the problem with with government itself enough. They need to recognize more so that uh, government is basically strangling us. Well, it's a free country, um, I think, yeah. and they're welcome to believe that. But I actually think they're starting from premises that um, they're they're taking for granted, and it's actually not simply government constraining everything. And as I get into in my Burnham essay. Um, yeah, let's, what let's we do call, that. What okay, we call the that. free market isn't the free market of Adam Smith. What we call free trade isn't the free trade of David Ricardo. And if we, if we get too wrapped up in these airy dogmas, um, we actually miss a lot of what's going on behind these broader social transformations. And I think the libertarians in, um, in taking these assumptions for granted um, actually have made the problem worse, not better. Yeah, no, thank you. So let's get into your James Burnham piece here. So your essay, James Burnham's managerial elite. So maybe tell us about James Burnham, uh, just maybe here initially, because I think he's, he's one of these forgotten thinkers, unfortunately, uh, and maybe that is its own tale. Uh, and then what does he offer us uh, in explaining and understanding our present discontents? Yeah, uh, he has been sort of forgotten. He may be undergoing a, a bit of a revival. It's not just me that has written about him recently. Um, but, you know, he's a very interesting figure who really begins his intellectual life as a communist, uh, a Trotskyite communist, um, and eventually breaks with communism around the time of Molotov-Ribbentrop. Um, but he breaks with it in a, in a unique way in that he sees, uh, or, or his critique is that the history, economic history is pushing us away from capitalism, but it's not moving toward socialism or, or a true Marxist communist revolution. What we're entering into is a new period of economic history that he calls managerialism, in which the traditional notions of capitalist property, um, capitalist ethics, capitalist politics, uh, which, are, which are sort of the classical liberal um, John Locke type of uh, social contract uh, political philosophy, those principles are no longer applicable in this world. And what is happening is that economic control is shifting from the capitalist owners to, in his terms, uh, the managers, who are, of course, the credentialed, technically trained uh, engineers and other members of the elite that end up running these corporations and controlling the vast majority of our economy, uh, despite not being owners and entrepreneurs in the classical sense. Um, and again, that's the essay that I, or that's the work in the essay that I focused on. I think it's very interesting, or I think it's really his most interesting piece. Um, but uh, he, he went on from there. Actually, he, he sort of took some of it back. He, he later claimed that he thought that essay was still too Marxist. Um, and his later work, he moves from there to a book called The Machiavellians, um, which is much less economics focused and more of a um, sort of an attempt to critique a lot of the ideologies of, of various times and, and governance, uh, in his view, in the tradition of Machiavelli. Um, now, someone coming up uh, within the Straussian political philosophy framework can find a lot of his interpretation of Machiavelli that's maybe a little questionable, but nevertheless, uh, a very powerful book. Um, and he looks at some, some other forgotten thinkers uh, like uh, Sorrell and Pareto as well. And then from there, he actually, you know, you really start to see a movement toward what looks to us more like conventional conservatism uh, with a very strong here, he adopted a very strong anti-Soviet position during the Cold War, 
Um, he joins the, the he's a founding member of National Review um, in the mid 1950s. Uh, he, he develops an interesting kind of reputation for policy pragmatism, at least in domestic policy, um, supporting uh, <clears throat> Rockefeller and, and Nixon, for yeah. example. Yeah, um, yeah, it was interesting. You know, Bill Buckley said that the intellectual influence of James Burnham on National Review in the early years was, without question, the biggest, so the largest yeah. imprint. So that. That is interesting because, you know, we think about those early contributors. I mean, it's interesting to me, too, as someone who's written on Whitaker Chambers, Whitaker Chambers admired Burnham the most of the editors that he worked with at National Review. Uh, he did not have the same, I mean, he had respect for Russell Kirk. He had respect for Frank Meyer, but he thought their conservatism was of the 19th century. And they hadn't taken into account both the New Deal and then, as Chambers said, they didn't take into account the Enlightenment. Maybe Burnham did more so, much more so. But thinking about this book, The Managerial Revolution, so I take it, and maybe this is what interests you now uh, in trying to apply his insights or uh, to our situation, is Burnham sort of does ask a fundamental question. It's almost a Marxist question. Who has power? And, and, and how do they justify that power? How do they exercise it? And that's where he starts, I think, in The Managerial Revolution. And so he sees entrepreneurs or capitalists aren't important, uh, because they ultimately can't run their large businesses alone. They need people with these competencies and skills, and this sort of begins this the growth of the managerial class. Correct, yeah. And, uh, and I think, as I say in the essay, I, I think this, this, the managerial revolution, whatever its flaws may be, um, was really, really the heart of Burnham's thought, um, even, even later on. And I think it also, you know, he never really quite gives up some of these Marxian intellectual influences, even if he rejects, you know, Marxism as a political program. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, as, as you mentioned, uh, he, he really does start from, from an analysis of economic circumstances and, and how that translates into political power and authority. He, he takes... Um, this concept of uh, the separation of ownership and control, um, which is behind the managerial revolution, and that, that is not his concept, really. He, he borrows it from Burl and Means, uh, who had written an earlier book on the topic, and I, I believe that that concept had been floating around in, in various other authors as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, no, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I just, but, but, yeah, exactly. And that... That is, that's, that um, impulse in, in modern capitalism, or call it 20th century capitalism, that was driving ever more uh, uh, power and economic uh, weight into the hands of, of managers uh, who were not owners, uh, he took to be not only an important economic yeah, influence, um, but also a, a major force that was transforming politics leading at once to the development of what we call today the administrative state, um, but also changing our basic attitudes uh, toward a lot of things like um, debt and, and uh, hedonism and so on, uh, which, which the later neoconservatives um, or the original neoconservatives yeah. also take up. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it starts with those economic developments. It's interesting. And in, in Burnham, too, I mean, we did a discussion on this in Law and Liberty a few years ago. His book, Congress and the American Tradition, might be sort of a political application of the managerial ideology. And that is to say, almost in the manner, not, not well, not almost, but maybe sort of similar to, you know, Carl Schmitt says parliamentary democracy no longer matters uh, in a mass democracy because it's predicated on debate, representation, exchange, but mass democracy is really about the power of numbers, uh, and that and that means that executive government is all important. Burnham seems to suggest in the Congress and the American tradition that Congress is a bourgeois tradition, uh, and, and it's a bourgeois tradition that no longer matters uh, in, in an age of specialization, in an age of managers, because what the executive branch can actually do and deliver it a lot more efficiently and a lot more with a lot more uh, power. Interesting on this uh, on the question of the hedonism. Uh, if, I, if I could yeah, just interject ahead. there, um, <clears throat> yeah, that's absolutely correct. And Burnham actually states that thesis, even though he doesn't expound on it much, in the managerial revolution. And for him, Congress legislative representation is a bourgeois capitalist principle 
mainly because the sense of political authority in classical capitalism is is based on the 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 need for the individual capitalist the individual owners to have a certain freedom to to exercise or to to ex- you know uh, enjoy the fruits of their property uh, and so the bourgeois in- institutions like congress exist to represent these independent capitalist owners but when the independent capitalist owner no longer becomes the driving force of the economy when all that matters is the competence of the managers in sort of increasing production and consumption, then the, you no longer need uh, legislative institutions, which are often uh, and intentionally cumbersome, um, dialogic, you know, discursive, and, and not built on efficiency. And then the efficiency of the executive branch and the administrative state becomes all important to maximizing the consumption of the people, to ensuring, um, in the memorable phrase, freedom from want. Yeah, no, I mean, it's interesting thinking about that. And, you know, the responses I hear to Philip Hamburger, which, um, you know, rarely contest him on his sort of deep um, uh, English-American constitutional case against the administrative state. I mean, I think he's written the most significant critique of the administrative state. But at the same time, everyone sort of concedes, well, what would we do? Uh, if we didn't have the FDA, what would we do? What would replace it? And no one seems to really have a good answer. And you can multiply that across the administrative state in terms of how much power, authority, and competency uh, that, it, that, it, that it would seem to exercise. I say competency in quotes, maybe. Um, but in, but in, in, in that regard, I guess maybe bringing your analysis forward, though. So Burnham, though, is writing Managerial Revolutions published in, correct me if I'm wrong, 1941. And it, it, so it's going forward. There's some pretty heavy Marxist elements in it. I think you would agree with that. Yes. How do you, but so why does that fit? That's a mass society, mass industry, mass production type of an analysis. That's not what we're in now in our current uh, sphere of production. Um, so talk about that now. Why does it matter well, now? Well, I would say that um, our our current Certainly the current U.S. economy is not predicated on heavy industrial production, but I think, uh, I think the overall managerial character of it um, is still very appropriate. And as I discussed later in the essay, the financialization of the economy that really began under Reagan is actually a further entrenching of the managerial uh, economic uh, arrangement. So talk about that for a minute, uh, this term, uh, financialization. It also shows up in Gladden Pappen's essay on conservatism in the first issue. Uh, talk more about what, is, what does that mean? Because I would, I would sort of think as a pro-market person, yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty good. We want people to be able to sell, invest, make money, uh, all of that sort of thing on, on an array of assets and services. Uh, but you, you seem to suggest this is an empowerment of the managerial class. Uh, why? Yeah, and I'll I'll just, one more bit of background. Um, Because I spent a lot of time in the financial world and in the investment world, and um, probably going in as a, a, you know, very enthusiastic, conservative, free market person, (laughs) and then seeing what it actually is uh, and and realizing the difference between um, financial markets activity today and that described by Adam Smith or whatever, um, it made me very sympathetic to Burnham's approach. And I would argue that it it seems like uh, financialization, which is putting more and more economic activity under financial markets, seems like, again, empowering free markets. But what is actually happening is is that most of the shareholders of of the large corporations today, um, again, are not really owners. Um, They are institutional investors, institutional investment managers, who receive their capital from another group of institutional investment managers called Fund of Funds, who in turn receive their capital from another group of uh, institutional investment managers, often pension funds, endowment funds, uh, etc. And many of these actually ultimately come back to the state. Um, so actually most of these people don't really think of themselves as owners in any, in any uh, certainly in any Adam Smith sense. What they are is temp- they have a temporary allocation of capital um, that they look to manipulate uh, and, and uh, it, you know, make a profit on as quickly as possible. Uh, and this actually produces some 
some very interesting effects that I don't I don't think are um, consistent with free market theory. Um, specifically, a lot of short-termism in the managing of corporations and investments. Uh, I've also seen it in, in various places. You know, a lot of a lot of our biotech uh, and pharma activity today is not actually spent on making better uh, medicines, but uh, creating drugs that the doctors who prescribe them will get more reimbursements from Medicare or something. There's a surprising amount of that. And so I think, you know, the the gap between free market theory and financial markets in in practice is quite large, and I think a lot of it is actually explained by, um, by Burnham's theories back in 1941, even though, as you mentioned, it was a very different type of economy. Yeah, no, I mean, it, you, you say that, I mean, and I thought that was uh, interesting. I guess my, so my question is, okay, so this is an empowerment, you say, of the managers uh, with the financialization, and, and I see your point in that regard. Um, but I guess my, so, but I guess the larger question that would loom is, is there not still market discipline Ultimately, I mean, don't those managers still have to earn some sort of a return on capital that justifies their position? They do, but but how do they do it? Um, it's not through. And I'm going to borrow. I'm going to borrow uh, Daniel Bell's phrase here from the Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism. Uh, I, I love that book. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not through remaking the world through economic activity or entrepreneurialism. It's basically through guessing and, and getting the market timing right on the interventions of the Fed. Um, and I think you also see a lot of, as, as more and more acti- economic activity has come under the financial markets, I think the financial markets themselves have changed and themselves have been brought under a lot of, of managerial uh, authority. Uh, so you, you get things like the Greenspan put and too big to fail which are very far from classical free market doctrine, uh, but which have in a way become social imperatives. And so I'm not sure that the markets even actually really function that efficiently to allocate capital anymore. Um, it's, I think it's debatable how much they even function as markets or how much they are, they are simply uh, reactions to the Fed. Um, <clears throat> well, certainly, I mean, interesting. I mean, the, the, the Fed has been... Uh, the largest financial intermediary I've read uh, since 2008, uh, the largest investor. Uh, and, you know, and so we can assume that a central investor taking over those functions from an array of private investors probably hasn't done it that well or has left a lot of money, a lot of gains on the table. Uh, we, we don't know well, what wealth hasn't it, been created. They, they, because they've of. definitely, it, it's, it's, it's been done differently. Um, and, and again, it's, it's this notion that, the important thing in the economy is, is not actually the freedom to be an entrepreneur, but the important thing in the economy is to increase consumption by whatever, whatever means necessary. So I actually think that until recently, um, they have done pretty well on the latter. Um, but the question, I think the deepest question, and this is a bit of my own interpretation mixed with Burnham, but the deepest question raised by Burnham is precisely this separation of production and consumption, uh, which is a direct challenge to classical capitalist theory. And if you're going to have an economy predicated on consumption, then you're not going to have uh, a system based on entrepreneurialism. Uh, no, 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 maybe talk about that, because I, I, mean, I, would, I would think you would, so what am I missing? I mean, I think you would, you would have to have it at a certain level uh, production, even if you're offshoring a lot of that production, you've got to find a way of uh, a, a talented investor class, a talented managerial class, all sort of putting this together to make to make this consumption of high end goods possible. Well, right, that's the point. Uh, the talented managerial class becomes the most important piece of it, uh, and the entrepreneur class um, becomes increasingly less important. Now, now, it's interesting. So, I want to ask you a couple a couple of follow up questions. Many many provocative statements in Krein's essay. Uh, one, I just want to read and, and maybe ask a question here. You say 20th century conservatism in many ways accelerated the development of managerial uh, society. You say maybe the chief effect of uh, Reaganism uh, was the further empowerment of the managerial class. Clinton empowered it, you say, in a different way uh, than George W. Bush uh, in his own, you know, Wilsonian way did, did so also. But I guess so, but maybe, maybe I'm too conventional. I probably am. Uh, 
Many would say, though, that under Reagan, uh, with, with tax cuts and the continuation of the deregulatory policies of the Carter administration, you unleashed a lot of capital uh, that, that reinvested itself in ways that really disciplined a lot of bloated companies and really disciplined a lot of managers. Those managers tried to respond uh, with, with poison bills and ways to protect themselves in corporate law uh, from takeovers. Mostly were not successful. And, and so we really had that, that Mitt Romney, Bain Capital moment uh, where a lot of companies were brought to heel and this unleashed a wave of innovation, including uh, Silicon Valley. H- how would you respond to that? Well, I think, I think that's correct, and, and here's where I'm, I'm maybe adding to Burnham a bit. There's no question that the sort of 1980s financial revolution um, disrupted, to use the word of the day, um, a, uh, a lot of the sort of old big companies that were in the conventional Burnham sense run by managers. However... What did they actually replace them with? And the private equity firms, the the hedge funds, the financial managers were not entrepreneurs. They were just other managers. Uh, And that was successful, again, in in boosting consumption. But I would ask the question, was it actually successful in any lasting way of, of reducing the size of government, restoring limited government, restoring constitutional government? And I think the honest answer to that has to be no. Reagan didn't really shrink the size of government at all. And in the end, he did improve the economy by empowering these financial managers, but he didn't really um, change the, uh, the sort of larger course of, of managerialism. Well, I mean, that, and that's interesting. You know, it, it, it maybe this supports your thesis. Maybe it uh, disagrees somewhat. If you talk to a number of people, say like Christopher DeMuth, longtime president of AEI, sure. a student of administrative power, uh, you know, and, and also there was, there was a young judge at the time in the D.C., younger judge, D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, Antonin Scalia, um, really wanted to have uh, a powerful administrative state to enable these deregulatory reforms to go forward because you couldn't trust Congress to do it. And so, you know, Reagan really did want to have sort of the, the, that, that leniency that, uh, that we're all against now, a lot of conservatives are against now, the administrative state wanted to ha- keep that in play so your people can make the right regulatory adjustments uh, to preserve that going forward. I say Reagan probably didn't shrink the size of government. I think that's that's true, uh, and yet he does seem to alter the trajectory of the way we think about government. At least in the Clinton presidency, this is why Barack Obama hated Bill Clinton because he thought he was a compromiser on the on the backside of of Reaganism. Uh, but he did he did reduce taxes, and and it is it does seem impossible to think about the growth of the 1990s absent that sort of you know, that, that, that sort of uh, response we saw in the Reagan administration. Even if, as you say, and I think I largely agree with you, the size of government didn't really decrease. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the, uh, the question is there. Uh, well, I mean, just in, in general, it, it does seem that Reagan had a, had a profound effect, um, at least in understanding the 1990s economic renaissance. Um, there was, oh, yeah, no, I, way, look, there was I, no way to go back and question what he did, and I think, and the, and the chief effect economically was, I mean, I'm just repeating myself here, was, you know, really to, re- to rethink uh, the corporate business sector in America and make it more competitive. Yeah, I, I, would, I, I would not disagree with the statement that he had an effect, and I would not disagree with the statement that obviously it produced more growth, um, etc. But <clears throat> I would say that that result and that effect came not through restoring any sense of entrepreneurialism, but actually just, uh, just yeah. well, as I, it, in my own words, liberating the managers um, and, 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 uh, and somewhat, and, you know, yeah, okay. uh, empowering the managers further. Specifically, I think, uh, and, and this is kind of an interesting aspect of the left um, and what Clinton did, where... I think, you know, it used to be, I think, the, the managers um, were really capital, labor, et cetera, was still very grounded in kind of national uh, aspects. And this may have just have been a function of the Cold War as well. Um, but after financialization, after the Cold War, certainly in Clinton, um, you have, again, this a much more accommodating move toward what seems like a free market and financialization. Uh, but at the same time, capital, labor, et cetera, has all come to be further separated from the actual national political community. Um, and we, co- we start to see any constraints 
on these things in the name of you know, the United States or, or the people as, as being uh, impositions on the free market. Um, and I think that is, a, that is a, a, an aspect of Reaganism that is more in alignment with managerialism rather than a restoration of any classical uh, yeah. Capitalist principle. Now, now thinking just sort of in, in line in which the sort of uh, intertwined economic political analysis of, of your essay, um, so you're, you're not that bullish about Silicon Valley uh, and what it could do uh, going forward. Um, wh- why? Well, I think that, you know, some. I, I wanted to include it in there. And, and I, I should, say, I should the, say, when I yeah. say Silicon Valley, their ability to uh, destabilize systems, to destabilize, say, um, that, that sort of the, the, the way in which we do economics, the way in which we do politics, because if they could actually found these companies, then presumably that has a political effect in your analysis. Yeah, well, and it looks like a, a counterexample to the larger trend, which is most Silicon Valley companies, you know, have active founder owners. Um, yeah, the yeah. founder manages the business, etc. Um, and I think, you know, as I say, I think maybe some of its success is related to that. Uh, but I don't think it represents a true escape from the larger managerial system, simply because it's it's mostly dominated by the venture capital investors who are. Uh, ultimately part of the same managerial financial system, and they need to sell into the same managerial financial system. They ultimately need to IPO or sell to somebody else to make money. The other thing I think that's interesting about Silicon Valley is actually that most of the companies, even the really uh, the valuable ones, don't actually make any profits. Uh, and this is a uniquely managerial um, uh, effect. You say that in, in 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 classical capitalism, of course, you know the it, it's it's profit profits that matter, um, and and debt is seen as something that one has to be very careful about. Managerialism, uh, and this this kind of overlaps with its ethic of cultural hedonism, uh, has a much more relaxed view about companies that actually lose money. Um, debt doesn't really matter, both in in sort of moral sense as well as in practice uh and and again the you know reagan of course expanded the debt tremendously as did bush and everyone else and uh and and debt doesn't matter as much in the managerial framework as it does in the classical capitalist framework um and so money losing companies uh are are able to um maybe persist for longer or receive new funding uh new debt and equity funding for much longer than they would in your classical capitalist framework. And I think that's something that Silicon Valley relies upon a great deal. Yeah, and I'm not, I mean, you, you would understand finance much better than me, but when, when I, is, is it also the case, though, some of these Silicon Valley companies have been very successful, um, have made a lot of money, and uh, yeah, a huge question mark is, can the companies coming online turn their business model into, you know, into real dollars and into this this social uh, you know, gathering of information, can they actually find a way to turn it into real money? And a lot of people are still betting that they can. And so they're willing to put up with the debt. Am I wrong? Well, yeah, that, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the premise. And some of them, of course, actually do become phenomenally yeah, successful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot of them don't. Um, and, no, and I know you're so saying I can, they're not. I can, I, can, I can find you probably 20 to 50 companies in Silicon Valley valued at over, you know, a billion dollars that have, you know, or take take a look at the recent Snapchat IPO. Oh, yeah, um, no, I, everyone's I <laughs> everyone's betting on growth in that. Uh, that thing has never made any money. I don't really see how it can. Um, and I could of course be wrong, but again, you see a willingness there to to uh, put up with money losing corporations that I don't think you would have seen with uh, you know John Rockefeller in 1901. Yeah. No, no. Is it, I want to. Uh, no, I mean there has been market discipline in Silicon Valley in the past. Uh, you know, we did have a we had a fairly significant recession. I mean, I, I was in law school during the time I remember it, 2000, 2001. Um, uh, and and it's, it's, not, it's not unlikely. I mean, are, are you saying Silicon Valley is, is sort of, uh, in your analysis, are they sort of removed? 
in a certain sense for market discipline, or are there just a lot of suckers uh, still putting in money, hoping that something's going to come out? Rosy? No, I, I, again, I, I only pointed out Silicon Valley in the, in the in order to show that it's not totally yeah. distinct yeah. from the larger manager. It, again, it's one paragraph in the essay, um, so I don't want to make too big of a deal. Oh, out well, of it, well, but I, I know. I, I just, one, I just wanted it's... to, I just wanted to highlight that while it might seem the total opposite of managerialism, there are actually many characteristics that it shares with it and indeed relies upon. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thinking about um, uh, maybe maybe your essay um, on the the. The managerial class. So you, you sort of, I take it, you, you don't dismiss, but you ultimately think that an analysis of where we are now couldn't be cultural in terms of our leadership elites. It's, it really is an economic function because... I, I, it can't be solely cultural. Okay. And I think that's a mistake that the, the neoconservatives made. And, and perhaps I think it was probably well, talk- largely motivated by a very real concern with the Soviet communist threat at the time. Um, but, you know, I think the original neoconservatives really tried to separate um, the development of culture from the development of the economy. Dan Bell, in particular, did that. And I actually think Burnham's approach, which sees both economic developments and cultural developments um, sort of occurring concomitantly, and I, I don't want to get into which one is the most important or primary or first, um, I don't know that there's even much to be gained from that debate, but I don't think that you can separate the two yeah. entirely. Well, and I think that's been a problem for conservatism because they have sort of thought that, well, we have capitalism and it's great and we're just going to liberate the free market on the one hand. And on the other hand, you know, we're just going to get some better university reading lists and we're going to knock out postmodernism and it's going to be great. And, uh, and actually, I don't think this works because underlying a lot of our problems is not just postmodernism and it's not just political or cultural issues. It actually is and includes deeper transformations in the broader economy and, and simply liberating the managers a bit more is actually not going to solve the problem. So we're thinking, I mean, so we would think about um, like Hillary Clinton uh, or, you know, uh, people of people of her ilk of her, generation setting themselves against capitalism, but they end up joining it or, or they're, they're very political, but at the same time, they, they suddenly realize, and maybe the paradigm of this is Bill Clinton early in his administration. I read, Oh, wow. I really do need wall street on my side. Uh, enter Robert Rubin, uh, treasury, yep. treasury secretary, and sort of this sort of the new class, uh, you, you quote crystal's great phrase there. The new class realizes that they need wall street. I mean, that's, I guess that sort of gels with what you're saying. They need wall street, but we do. So we have this um, interesting group, uh, interesting bunch, uh, not entirely on board uh, with the American uh, constitutional order, we might say. Um, and yet they get into they get into the major they get into media, they get into finance, they're an opinion making formation uh, institutions that are private. And there's a sort of and then they, as we saw on brilliant effect. Uh, in many presidential administrations, and with the Obama administration, it was pretty poignant, the moving back between uh, Wall Street media and Washington, D.C. government positions. Yes, I think actually that development where the left uh, has sort of ceased to be, um, to use the most provocative word, Marxist or socialist mm-hmm. um, in, in the conventional sense, and has sort of become... Uh, openly managerial, namely, again, the likes of the Clintons or Podesta um, or, or these guys who, who really, you know, cease to see themselves as really uh, uh, populist, um, as, as the old left kind of did, and, and starts to see themselves as just being the most enlightened managers. Yeah. And and uh, therefore opens up a a lot. There, I, I you know, there's a lot more people on Wall Street than le- that lean left than lean yeah, right. Yeah, they yeah. see this kind of a cultural orientation. You know, I, I don't. You know, the, the richest zip codes in the country are are heavily Democratic. I oh, think yeah, yeah, the, the most famous ones are. Um, and that's a remarkable development in our politics, and I think shows. Uh, Burnham's prescience in kind of predicting that the divide would not be a conventional left-right thing, um, or even or even rich-poor thing in a conventional capitalist sense, but who has managerial power and who doesn't? 
Yeah, and I mean, I think of you know Angela Cota Villa, sort of along these lines. I mean, the yep. famous, the famous, the ruling class. The left has the managerial power. The Democratic Party holds the managerial power uh, in major corporate and also in Washington. And the Republicans seek to uh, inevitably seek to uh, situate themselves somewhere within their nest within that. And so we get, as he said, the ruling class, uh, and which ignores ends up ignoring most of the voters. Um, and, yeah, and and, 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 and I guess I, I add to that, you know, yeah. why, why have the Republicans been totally clueless? And I think the answer is because they have ignored the underlying economic shifts, um, you know, that have gone with the cultural changes that Burnham pointed out, um, and instead kind of tried to fought these, fight these battles independently. And what I think has happened is, you know, when, when the Republicans align with managerialism, they're somewhat successful uh, and and the rest of the time they're sort of fighting these uh, hopeless reactionary battles that never have a chance. Uh, and so the only thing that happens is managerialism uh, ends okay. up being the consensus of both parties and advances. Well, obviously things have changed. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, maybe just the end of your essay. You draw on Burnham uh, and, and, and Burnham, you know, how a capitalist society comes undone and blends into or leads into the managerial society. And you sort of draw on that. And you have some, you have some interesting markers here, uh, which maybe we can talk about a few of them here at the end, in and, and, and which you know, you're arguing the end of managerialism, maybe, or, or maybe a shift in managerialism from uh, a, a global uh, mentality or one that is disconnected from citizenship or American citizenship to managers who are more nationalist oriented. But the problems with our managerialism and the reason why it's failing, uh, you say inability to reduce mass unemployment. Uh, economic cycles no longer trending higher, uh, public and private debt at all-time highs, instability and manipulation of foreign exchange, excess uninvested cash, um, and and some others. But maybe talk about those overall. I shouldn't do. You've got nine. Maybe just talk about yeah. that. The the end of the the managerialism no longer can fulfill the ends that that justified it, which is uh, making our lives better in a very materialistic sense. Yeah. Well, so all of those. Um, come from Burnham's managerial revolution, and and he cites these nine factors as as key signals that the classical entrepreneurial capitalism um, had had failed and was in recession, and that managerialism was in the ascendancy and would soon become the new sort of ruling class. And reading that uh, today, I was struck by the fact that eight out of the nine actually apply pretty easily to our current situation. Um, and I would say, actually, the, the one about uninvested cash is maybe the most salient one for me. I think it's you know, incredibly striking and actually a, a shocking um, a problem for a lot of conservative economic theory or, or conventional economic theory, I should say, is, is how much uninvested cash has sort of piled up in a, in a low-rate environment. Um, but anyway, uh, the fact that all of these can be said about our own time and, and the general discontent and, of course, the election of Trump and Brexit and so on uh, signals that maybe we might be undergoing some kind of change away from the managerial consensus of the last several decades. And I, you know, I'd like to be as strong as Burnham in saying that it's absolutely happening. I don't think I can be, uh, to be honest, uh, mainly because it's not clear to me that there's any new elite rising to take its place. Um, but I, I also argue uh, toward the end that a lot of managerialism's problems comes from uh, the kind of separation from the political community that sort of underlies its competence um, also ends up destroying itself uh, and, cre- and, and makes this managerial class totally detached and incompetent uh, and, and therefore undermines its legitimacy and its power. And perhaps the only uh, solution would be to have a new elite that is uh, more grounded in, in the actual political community and that therefore could successfully challenge the, um, the flailing managerial cast we have now. So here at the end, um, uh, I, I mean, I think someone who's written, if, if, I, if I understand you correctly, with the, on the disconnected point, or the disconnected uh, parts of the man, or the disconnected managerial class from uh, the broader American society, from democratic accountability. Charles Murray's written about that extensively, right? Mm-hmm. And so you would largely agree with that. Okay. Uh, so your, so your, your maybe maybe a takeaway here as we end. Um, uh, what 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 could happen? A, a, a beneficent outcome would not be the reduction of the size of government. That's you say that's a pipe dream. 
but just uh, managers more in tune with American national interest. I mean, that's so. We're, yeah, I think okay. I think we have to get out of this dichotomy of big versus small government. I think it's pretty useless um, and and actually counterproductive. And and it's it's going to come down to more of uh, what is the government for. What is the government for? Okay. Well, Julius Krein, uh, thank you so much. We'll be reading uh, American Affairs, the, the editions of American Affairs, uh, as they come out. And, and thank you for your time today. I've enjoyed discussing your essay, James Burnham's Managerial Elite. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This is your host, Richard Greinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.